All right, Ephesians chapter 5. But before we discuss that, we're going to jump to verse, we're going to go to verse 21. So we left off at verse 21. The Bible says, submitting yourselves one to another. So the Bible says it is important that we submit to each other in the fear of God, because we have to fear God. So that's the whole point. You might say, why is that important? The thing that everybody struggles with the most nowadays, and it's not a certain class of people that we can pick. It's actually everybody has this issue, and that is submission. Submission is such an important doctrine because we're totally living in a day and age of independence. That's the idea, critical thinking. But they forget the important teachings about loyalty, about obedience, about submission. But people don't care about that anymore because why? We're in America. We can do what we want. As a matter of fact, some people might hate me for saying this, but it's important to say it, is that there's a lot of people who are into conspiracy theories. And that kind of teaching attracts them where it's actually rebellion or insurrection, or opposing against authority. You might say, why? They have a trouble with submission and obedience. Does that mean that we're supposed to go at the whims of uh, dictatorial leaders and who cause you to sin? No, you don't obviously submit to the point where you it costs you of your spiritual walk. It causes you to sin. Obviously, that's a drawing line, but see, people don't think about that. They're just totally thinking what I want to do. I want to be free, 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 free. But when they think about freedom, they're thinking about being free according to the whims of their flesh, how they feel. That's slavery because your boss, your master is actually the flesh then. It's not the word of God. Submission is such an important doctrine and the following things that we are supposed to submit, one of them is going to be to each other. That's, in part, that's important, to the brethren. Now, this is probably one of the most important verses that will cover submission for all categories and groups. So pastors might think they have the authority over the members. The husbands have the authority over their wives. And the parents have the authority over their children. And then government leaders... The, having the authority over their people, but the leaders don't recognize that the submission, uh, when God has blessed them with authority, or if it's not really a blessing, if he authorized them a position of leadership to be in charge over people, a lot of them take that power of abuse into their hands and control people and tell them what they want them to follow. But the Bible says that we can't forget we got to submit to each other. Government is there to lead, but it's actually also there to serve the people. The pastor is a position of leadership and authority, and members are supposed to submit and listen. But the pastor, his position, is also known, the word minister means to serve. Right. It's a leadership position that serves the people as well, the member. Jesus Christ, he is our Lord and Savior and leader, but he put himself into a position of a servant by washing his disciples' feet. So what did he tell them? He says, uh, do to each other as I've also done likewise. All right, go to the book of John. Look what Jesus represented. He's our Lord and Savior. We have to worship him, not just submit and obey him, but worship him. But God himself was able to come down in humble human flesh and serve mankind. That's something. That's something. All right, open up your Bibles to the book of John, and we'll look at uh, chapter, John chapter 15, I think. We'll go over here, John chapter 15. Let's take a look over here. I think it's much earlier than that one. I'm just going off from memory. I think it's 13 or 14 then. Let's go back. Let's go back. So, John, is it John chapter 13? Let's see. Yep, John chapter 13. And we're going to look at verse 5, verse 5. Now, if you're not 
some of you might say, well, I ain't willing to uh, submit. That's like practically stooping down at somebody's feet, you know, their stinking feet and then prostrating myself before them. Well, look what God Almighty did. He knelt on the ground before the people's feet and not just uh, knelt down before people's feet, but even washed their dirty feet. That's how much of submission he put. Look at verse 5. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Not only that, he decided to dry their feet as well. God Almighty, in your dirty, stinking feet, your level, you should be bowing down before his feet. Not only should we be bowing down before his feet, we should wash his feet. Verse 6. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou, what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Uh, we'll look at verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me master and lord, and ye sell, say well, for so I am. If I then your lord and master have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. Man, that'll preach. Notice that Jesus recognizes his position of power and authority and leadership, but he also says that if I can kneel down, wash other people's feet, and serve them, you should do the same thing as well. The idea of submission that people do not think about is that it is service. It is serving others. That's the whole key. Serving others. So when pastors take their position, are they serving them? Are they helping them, ministering to them? That's the same thing with the government. That's why they can't abuse their power. See that? Now, this is important when you go back here, go back to Ephesians 5. God says it's done in the fear of the Lord when you submit one to another. You might say, why should I fear the Lord in that case? Oh, very simple, my friend, because you know who you're serving? The body of Christ. What? Did you forget that? That's good. Because you got to realize that when you're mistreating one of the Say, brethren, you're mistreating one of God's body members. Yes. See that? That's why you should fear God. I mean, remember the previous verses, the context of all about submission, especially later on as we continue Ephesians 5, it's about the body of Christ. The whole context of the Many verses behind was about body of Christ, body of Christ. There is no doubt in the book of Ephesians, there are so many times the topic and idea is about the body of Christ. So because it's about God's body, that's the reason why you should serve the brethren. Why? Because if you don't fear them, you should fear God. And it doesn't matter how much you think that the brethren is feeble compared to you. The Bible says that 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that we make up the honor for them on the feeble parts. That's our job. Why? Because they're part of the body of Christ. That is so important. But also, you members got to realize this. If you're the one that's the more feeble, and you can't just keep abusing the service from the leaders or brethren who are more mature than you. You're supposed to serve them as well. I mean, the idea that we abuse each other where people think you're supposed to serve me and the leaders are supposed to say you're supposed to obey me see that's the idea of selfishness and we forget the idea that the bible says that submission should be done to each other that is so important not me if you put me in there automatically one time in your mind when you're doing service to the brethren then you're at fault you should repent you should get right with god all right, let's go back to Ephesians 5. The problem with churches today, it's always a me problem. Why did he preach that? Why didn't the member come to church that day? 
Why didn't anybody say hi to me and give me a little hug or a kiss? You know, it goes that far. Believe it or not, people go that far, but that's churches. They forget the idea that church is supposed to serve each other. Not that deacons serve the members, pastors serve the members, or that members should serve the pastor. It should be done toward each other. And then people think, man, this is truly a loving church. Okay, go back to Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. So that should be plain. It's self-explanatory. Wives, you're supposed to submit yourself to your own husband. And it's done as unto the Lord. Right. Second, who well, you're supposed to su uh, submit. It's wives submitting to the husbands. Why should I submit to the husband? Because he's abusive. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Sometimes my husband's dumb as a bag of rocks, etc., etc. Okay, <laughs> look, we're living in the... I know that we're living in the millennial times, and that's the automatic thinking. That's the first thought in women's minds. First of all, not all women are under abusive husbands nowadays. So why is that the first thing dawn in your mind? My second question is this. Why do you, as a woman, automatically think that in your mind when most likely you're the woman who doesn't have such an abusive husband? So see, that's the problem. You know what the problem is? Again, it's the problem with submission. It's selfishness again. Automatically, they're thinking about themselves. Well, what about this? What about that? That's the same thing like an atheist. Why don't you get saved in Jesus Christ? Well, why did God allow so much suffering then? See, that's the automatic thing in their minds. It's about me, 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 and why should I do this? What if the person mistreats me, etc.? You know, you got to be more concerned about yourself more than the other person. I mean, that's the whole thing about submission. You know why I serve other people? Not because I'm a lapdog, because I'm more concerned about myself than you. <laughs> now, that might sound a little weird to you, but isn't that the idea? Why should you submit? Because I'm more concerned about myself, I fear God. If you want to be selfish, there should be something you're selfish about, is you're concerned more about your spiritual welfare. That's one thing you should be selfish about. Now, why should wives submit to the husbands? What if uh, he's abusive, etc., etc.? Go to the book of Acts. Now, notice what uh, Peter and the apostles did. We're going to go to the book of Acts, and then we'll go to chapter 3. Chapter 3. We'll go to the book of Acts, and then chapter 3. Now, notice that the prophet said they were bold. I mean, if you start off at verse 14, Acts chapter 3, verse 14, but ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. So they were in trouble. Let's go back. We're going to look at verse 7. Verse 7. And when they had sent them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have he done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Now notice over here that he's speaking to the leaders the people that they're supposed to submit unto. But notice over here by their language, it doesn't seem like that they're very submissive, right? It doesn't seem like that they're very obedient or following orders. Let's look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. So they were imprisoned for that. Why? Because they rebelled against authority here. They did not listen to these leaders. Verse 29, Acts chapter 5, verse 29 then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. That's the key. The key is this, is that, well, what if I get a husband who sins, like abusive and who is uh, wicked, causes me and tells me don't go to church, don't serve God? Very simple. The idea concerning about submission and obedience, it goes by a priority level. 
You're not looking at the priority level. You know what your priority is when you say about abusive husband? Me. That's your problem. That is your problem. You women can stone me to death, but guess what? I'm going to get on to the husbands and they'll stone me to death. And then pretty much no one will love me except Jesus Christ, probably. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm speaking that out of arrogance, okay? So I'm just, I'm just being mean. So me, the idea is this. That's your priority when you think about abusive husband, when the husband causes me to sin, etc. See, that's your problem. You're not focusing on God, are you? Now, if you focus on God first, then you know the routine. Then it goes to husband. See that? You know what your idea is? This is your fantasy. Me, then God, then my husband. And that's the idea. Because why? You're, you're at least that spiritual. You'll put God above your husband. <laughs> you're at least that spiritual. So you got to realize this is that this is the authority God ordained. And there's a lot of debate and discussion. So let's make this simple. A couple arguments is this. Is that one, you got to realize this. One so I'm not going to go through too much of the routine, but we're going to uh, cover this one by one for the women. Let's go to the book of Genesis chapter 3. This is as old as Eden. So this has not changed throughout any dispensation. That's the reason why this doctrine is very important, because this is a doctrine that did not change from the beginning. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We'll look at verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And husbands, you have to take authority in the home. A lot of husbands aren't doing that. Right. Now look, I'll get to the husbands who act abusive later, all right? Don't get all sensitive, all right? Calm down. But husbands got to take authority. I think a lot of, uh, I'm preaching against everyone's sin here because I think there are men who don't like to take charge. They want to lay off the responsibility. But you men have to act responsible. If things go wrong in your house, you can't just say, well, my wife does this, my wife does that. Hey, man, you're in charge. Fault goes to you. So you men got to take charge and you got to take accountability for the wreck that happens in your home. We like to blame it on the wife. Why? Because it can't be helped. She doesn't listen to me. And she decides this. She decides that. And then she's the one who decides for the kids and etc. I think you're just being lazy. Okay. I think you're just being lazy. Sometimes women, they're very like organized people and they do this and this and this. And then men, they're more, more uh, laxing people. They like to just relax and not uh, be bound by responsibilities. Maybe that's why the Lord knows both of your problems. So... Uh, he knows your weaknesses, so you got to switch. <laughs> but anyways, if we go to verse 17, look at this. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife. See that? Then look at the next part. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Look at that. I'm telling you, men, if you don't take charge, God does not approve of that. That's why he punished Adam. Yeah. Wow. So women, you've got to listen to the men, and men, you've got to take charge, rightfully so, and take responsibility, and don't be lazy. you got too much estrogen running in your blood, you men. That's your problem. All right, so your husband's got to take some grit. Don't be a eunuch, okay? Like at the book of uh, Kings, you know the, those eunuchs, they... Uh, they were under submission under a Jezebel that time and had to take a Jehu to give some eunuchs some guts. So some of you men are acting like a bunch of eunuchs. You don't have testosterone and you're just acting... You're just, in this millennial age, we're defending men who act more feminine. Yeah. So, then a guy who, so then a guy has to win a gold medal in the games for a what? In a women's competition. Wow. Sports. Yeah. Why? Because I, deep down inside, I'm a woman, says the guy. <laughs> all right, so then you husbands, you got to take charge, all right? So women's got to submit to the husband because that's what God ordained. Secondly, if you don't believe that's important, then you got to realize this. Once the women's lib got out, the 
uh, the woman started their women's lib and then their movement, divorce went super duper high. You might say, why is that? Because authority in the home is 50-50. That's the reason why. And when you have two leaders in the home, then God cannot bless that. Yeah. God ordained one leader. God ordained one leader. You tried three pastors running this church. You think that we're going to last long as a church? No, there's got to be one leader in this church. Right. It's the same thing with, uh, with the home. You got to do that way. You got to do that manner. If you don't set up a leader, one leader in the home, then when you get two leaders with two different uh, opinions, how is that house going to last? Right. It's got to be under one leader and one direction, one order, and that's how the home can survive. What if they cause me to sin? What if they do this and that? Then you just listen to God. That's it. Yeah. Well, it's so unfair. I got a crummy husband. And you can get lost husbands too. Go to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Yeah, you can get lost husbands. So then what do I do? Uh, so then I should disobey him, right? No, the, our government is consisting of a bunch of lost people headed for hell. Right. Yet God says we're supposed to submit yeah. under them. Yeah. But when they cross the line and tell us to sin or anything against the Bible, that's the only time we disobey. Yeah, we yeah. All right, look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Why? That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be what? Won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Uh, look at verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. So notice that it can be a good testimony to your husband. I mean, the lost husband, I mean, they're going to go like, what happened to this woman? <laughs> Why is she so nice? Why is she so sweet? Why is she listening to me on this and this and this? And then what do you think? Then he might go, he might go, wait a minute. You know, I mean, I've seen change in her life. She's being a good wife and not only that, a good mother. And she's always being clean and I can trust her when I'm gone. It's not like she's going to cheat on me. She's going to do something that's going to be against my authority unless it's something of that Christian garbage. She'll never listen to me when I tell her not to listen to that Christian garbage, but she does all the time. It drives me mad. But that's the same thing with parents. I have people here in our church through their testimony living amongst unsafe family members that they'll first think of us as a cult, but then they let them slide. Why? Because they've seen a change in their lives. Yeah. So that's the reason why you just focus on your role and let God handle it. You underestimate the power of testimony. That's your problem. Your problem is, is that you make the power of testimony very weak. You trust more in your own power, in your own method, not God's methods. God's methods is follow my rules and guess what happens? You display a good testimony and let the testimony win that person to Christ. That's good. Amen. That is good. All right, let's go back here. Let's go back. We'll go to Ephesians chapter 5. We've had some, uh, I have some people in my church who were men who were lost sinners headed for hell. But then the wives who got saved ahead of time and through their testimony, Christian walk, eventually the husbands would get saved later on. Amen, That's me. Amen brother. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, I... I should have kept it at 1 Peter 3, I'm sorry, but I'm going to read this next part of 1 Peter 3 once we go to Ephesians 5 as well. The verse says this is important that you got to submit to your own husband as unto the Lord. Yeah. Now, I, I think that I know that there's a mistake in your King James Bible, and the originals read very differently, and God couldn't be that dumb to put as unto the Lord. I mean, the Lord, I mean, my husband, Lord, yeah, I mean, you got to realize this. 1 Peter chapter 3, when you go over there, you have to, one thing what we don't understand is this. All of this that has to do with God's ordination on who to submit to, that's the point. It's not man's ordination or the husband's ordination. It's God's. That's why when you disobey the husband, you're disobeying God. Why? Because he set the command, not the husband. It's not the husband, it's God. It's the same thing toward our government leaders, our pastor, etc. So look at 1 Peter 3. 
I don't know when's the last time you ever called this to your husband, all right? Verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him what? Lord. Now, I, don't, I think I read that incorrectly. No, it says Lord. That's important to understand. So you got to realize that, women, that's how much you're supposed to honor, obey, and submit to the husband. Now, some of you might say, well, what if the husband does something that's against God? Then again, I told you before, you got to obey God. Well, this means then I can never have an opinion. Uh, what well, did you look at Genesis? Genesis. This is the same Sarah. Okay. This is the same Sarah who called Abraham Lord. Didn't you know God can speak through the woman and then the husband is going to have to hearken to the women at times? Right. You might say, oh, no, that's blasphemy. I mean, I'll go back to Genesis. We're going to look at chapter, let's see over here. We're going to go to the book of Genesis chapter 21, chapter 21, Genesis chapter 21. Notice uh, at verse 10, what did Sarah said to Abraham? <clears throat> now, this is a very extreme statement from any wife, all right? And I wouldn't blame a husband for disobeying, uh, not disobeying, for not listening, for not listening to the wife in this one. Verse 10, wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. I mean, if your wife said that, look, uh, I mean, cast out. I mean, she was talking about Abraham's other wife, the bondmaid. Cast, get rid of your son and your wife. <laughs> wow, that's really extreme. But notice what God said at verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, what did God say? Hearken unto her voice, listen to her. This doesn't mean women do not have an opinion. What are you talking about? All right, go back to Ephesians 5. Because let's admit it, men, sometimes we can be dumb like a bunch of rocks. All right, sometimes that happens, if not most of the time. All right, don't get a raise of hands. But uh, sometimes men are dumb and stupid. So because of that, a wife, when she throws in her opinion, her suggestion, the husband should not be automatically thinking, oh, no, whatever, you know, woman. Right. No, you got to realize this. The Lord could be using that. That's right. So that's why you men, it goes back to the previous verse, fear of the Lord. If you fear God and then you're wondering maybe God's using this person, it has to do with submitting to each other, right? And the fear of God. If you think like that, then the home can be a happy home. Amen. See that? All right, go back to Ephesians 5. What if the man makes a mistake and he thinks that this is God's will? Well, guess what? Romans 8, 28, bad or good, the Lord will take care of that. That's the point. I mean, even in any leadership today, leaders make mistake, period. Even with the best intention. So what you have to do is trust God, not yourself. That's your problem. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, and then we'll look at... Oh, by the way, let me add this. This might be helpful, okay? You'd be surprised that even though your idea might be better, all right, the one who is under authority, all right? So let's put the wife here as an example. Wives, you'd be surprised that even though your idea may be better and it may be the best route and method, you'd be surprised that the husband's worst idea is the one God blesses at the end and not yours. You might say, how do you know that? Because I know that because I've been through that. I was a member who was giving uh, my own opinion against a leader of authority and saying this is how should it, it should be done because it is true there was a genuine problem in church and then I said this is how it should be and guess what happened? It turned even worse. But guess what? In my church, it worked really well. See that? Why? Because God sets the authority on how the home and the ministry should be run, not you. All right, so remember that. You got to be careful. If God, if you're the one under authority, be careful. Even though you think your idea is better and it should work, it may in that situation, in your case and scenario, but not in God's home and not in God's ministry. Not when he's in charge and he knows the leader's mistakes, but he said, anyway, I ordain that person as a leader anyway. 
All right, I'm giving you good advice. All right? I'm giving you good advice because this pastor has so much knowledge. Don't you think it's so easy for this pastor to correct other preachers easily? I'm giving you really good advice, okay? Trust me. The best thing is to shut your mouth and to see how God moves, how God is moving in that person, and then see how the Lord moves. If that person is wrong, it will be shown wrong. That's right. I guarantee that. Yep. All right, go to Ephesians 5. For the husband is the head of the wife. So you're supposed to be the head of the wife, husbands, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Wow, what a big position you got here, man. Yeah. So you men have a, a very important position because just like the body of Christ, <coughs> the man is known to be as the head here. Because he is, the man is known to be as the head of the body, we got to realize that Christ is also known as the head of the body. So notice this comparison with the relationship of Christ and the church and the husband and the wife. We see that? Now, you'd be surprised how many hyper-dispensationalists are too dumb to see that. There are some hyper-dispensationalists, not all, but some of them who have the idiocy to teach that the, the bride of Jesus Christ is not the church. Are you kidding me? Did you read Ephesians? It's giving you a contrast here. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it, already we don't have to continue, but the verse will be more plain. But we already get so far that the, the woman or the bride of the husband is compared to Christ and the church. We already got that much. So the bride of Christ has to be the church. But let's keep reading. And he is the savior of the body. So uh, Jesus Christ, that's a no-brainer. He is the savior of the body. He saved us from hell. He saved us from our sins and iniquities. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so as much as the church obeys and subjects to Christ, uh, not that far, women, no, so let the wives be to their own husbands, see that, that far, and guess what, the Lord added a little bit more, okay, this is going to hurt you, so let the wives be to their own husbands in what? Everything. Every now, I don't have to explain that before you stone me to death, move on, all right, you guys got brains, all right? I don't have to say anything more. Move on. Okay, now I can beat down the husbands, but I'm I'm not willing. I'm not winning a popularity level anyway. Husbands are like, yeah, go get him, pastor. And then when I get you, you then I have nobody's friends. <laughs> All right, verse twenty-five. Husbands, love your wives. So husbands, you're supposed to love your wife. That's why if a person mistreats, abuses, takes control, you don't love your wife. Right. You gotta love your wife. Some people have a warped mentality that, oh yeah, I love my wife, so she, but then you boss around, tell her what to do, and etc. Well, this is what love, that's not love. Love is, look at this one, even as Christ also loved the church, uh -oh. it's the same love that Jesus Christ loves a church. Uh -oh. But look at the next part, and gave himself for it. That's love. Love is where you sacrifice yourself. Now, did you right. hear that, man? Right. Loving the woman is the same thing as Christ loved the church. And this love is based on what? When, you, uh, when the Bible says gave himself for it. Christ gave up his own life for the woman. Mm -hmm. So it's about sacrifice. Yes. Love is about sacrificing yourself. How does selfishness of men or husbands come into this picture? It's impossible because it says sacrificing yourself. That's good, so you have to sacrifice yourself if you love the wife. So then I know you don't want to eat those greens when your wife says eat the greens. It's healthy for you. All right, and you might say, woman, don't tell me what to do. All right, I can eat my greens. But here's the thing is that if you really love your wife, you love her, right? If you really love her, 
then eat your green, all right? It's not about yourself. It's about your, it's about your wife. So sacrifice yourself, all right, before God might just give you some kind of cancer or something unhealthy later on if you're not careful. Because remember, everything about submission is what? Fearing God. And maybe the Lord is speaking to your wife that moment saying, it's about time you start eat some veggies. Yeah, eat your kimchi. Eat your kimchi, brother. All right? If you fear God, you're going to eat that. Now, so that's the idea. You got to sacrifice yourself. Sometimes that can be very difficult, but you have to do that if you truly love her. Yes. All right? Think about this. All right? If the wife doesn't think that uh, you love her, why does she say that? Why does she feel that way? Mm -hmm. Especially women are very sensitive creatures and they can feel what you feel. And even though they might have a, a misconception of your feeling, which can happen at times, you do know this. They have a hyper radar. And they'll catch something that you men do, you know? So then if they feel that, you have to ask yourself, why do they feel that? Because you do know, uh, and if you don't know, you should talk to them about that. There's something that you didn't sacrifice yourself for her. If you did, then she would see that. She would know that. And if women have, are such selfish creatures that they don't see the sacrifice of the men, I mean, you women got a problem. So you got to realize this is all about each other. The idea about submission is toward uh, others, not yourself. That's the whole bottom line. The whole bottom line. Now let's keep reading. Verse 26. Okay. Some doctrine part gets me off the hook a little bit. Okay. So I'm off the pressure now. Verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Okay, so in verse 25, why did Christ sacrifice himself for the church, for us? It's so that at verse 26, he can sanctify. So sanctify means make it holy. He can make the church holy and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So he can cleanse it with water. And this water is known as the word, the word. Okay, so go to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. All right, so then the washing of water by the word of God. So the word of God is your water. Now, this is known as the King James Bible. We can obviously know that. We are so biased to believe in that. And yes, we are. So it is the King James Bible, 1611, the word of God. And it's supposed to cleanse us. When Christ died and saved us from hell, he did that so that he can clean us through his word of God, the Bible. Okay, so how is that done? First of all, uh, when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we do know this. When you are judged at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going through a cleaning process here. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at this cleaning process. Look at verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. So everyone's work is going to be manifest, shown. What did the Bible say at Ecclesiastes 12? Uh, For God shall bring every work into judgment, whether it be good or evil. So everyone's work is going to be brought up there. So what do we do with the evil works then? Look at, ver keep reading, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Look at uh, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, so see that's not a good work then. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now that's very powerful because that verse shows then that the fire burns up your bad works. Uh, when your bad works are burned up, that's why you're sanctified and cleansed. So one is the fire at the judgment seat of Christ. And notice that the verse says that you are saved. You're not burned. You're saved no matter what. So once saved, always saved. We really believe in that. Well, what if I commit some bad works? The fire will burn it off, but it doesn't touch you. So the fire is the one that will clean off the bad works. But go to Revelation now, 19. Here's the bride of Christ. 
Now look what the Bible says before she goes into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Look at Revelation 19. Revelation 19 and verse 7. We're going to go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. Notice she just went through a cleaning process. That's the judgment seat of Christ which we read. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his what? Wife. Wife hath made herself what? Ready. She went through some kind of preparation process. What is it? Cleaning. Look at verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen. Notice it's not the righteousness of Christ. The fine linen is the what? Righteousness of saints. See that? So why? Because God is judging your works, not Jesus Christ's work. He is judging your works, so then the bad works are cleaned off by the fire. So there's no doubt the bride of Christ, the wife of Jesus Christ, which is mentioned at Ephesians 5, she's going through a cleaning process by her Savior. Okay, go back to the book of Ephesians 5. So if your bookmark's there at Ephesians 5, then automatically jump to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Ephesians chapter 5. And then we're going to jump to John chapter 12. Now, if you look at Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> notice that the verse continues on at verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Look at that. That verse matches so much with Revelation 19, where Jesus Christ made ready his wife. Verse 27 shows Jesus Christ is presenting to himself. See, at that marriage, he's presenting to himself when she's coming down a glorious church. Why? Because Revelation 19 says her garments are clean and white. That's why the next part of verse 27 says that the church has what? Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. See, that's clothing here. Clothing marks that are cleaned off. So no spot, no wrinkle, or any such dirty thing. <clears throat> it's a holy church, and she's without blemish. How about that? So there's no doubt that she went through a cleaning process. So she has to go through that, the judgment seat of Christ. But the question is this, the question is at Ephesians 5, then uh, what is, uh, it mentions the word of God, not just fire. It's water, not just fire. What is the word of God? Well, it's just simple. All right, it's so simple. Look at John chapter 12. People don't realize this. Look at the word here, all right? Word of who? God. Now, use your brains now. You're telling me at the judgment seat of God, Christ, God is not going to say a single word to you. He's going to be mute the whole time. See, he has to talk to you. He has to judge you. He has to speak to you. Words have to come out of his mouth. That's the washing of water right there. See, at the judgment seat of Christ, the fire is cleaning you off as well as the water, which is what his spoken words to you at the judgment seat of Christ. Basically, Shame on you for not winning that soul to Christ. You don't think that's going to clean you up? Man, this is going to wipe out all the dirty stuff in you out of shame, and you're going to go like that. Look at verse 48, John chapter 12, verse 48. Don't you know that at the judgment, at the judgment, God's going to use the Bible when he uses his judgment on you? See, that's why at the judgment seat of Christ, we can see that the Bible will be used when God speaks to you, <clears throat> he's going to be quoting scripture. And can you imagine so much scripture coming out of his mouth when he judges you? And then you're going to feel so guilty and you're going to go, why didn't I, I know that verse? Why didn't I know about that verse? I read, I had the Bible all that time. I never saw that before in the Bible. I taught Bible class before, but I never knew that in the Bible. Man. Verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, see that, hath one that judgeth him. What's the one that's going to judge him? The word that I have spoken, 
The same shall judge him in the last day. See that? Wow. Christ's word is going to be the one that will judge you. Okay, go back to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. All right, so I hope you learned a very uh, important doctrine. So at the judgment seat of Christ, there are two things that will clean you, that will clean off the bad works, and that is fire and water. God's going to use fire and water. That's how, he's gonna, uh, that's how he cleaned off the earth, did he not? Water through the flood, and then the final day, fire. That's God's method of cleaning. All right, Ephesians chapter 5. So uh, some people w want to argue water baptism for salvation, so their proof text is verse 26. But that's laughable. Right. Why? You don't see baptism in here at all. It's the Word of God, verse 26, the Bible. It's that simple. Another heresy that you want to watch out for is Calvinism. And Calvinism will be found at verse 25. So 25, the Calvinists argue that Christ died, see, sacrificed his life, gave himself to the church. So this proves that Christ only died for the church, not for everybody. Thus it proves that Christ only died for the elect. That's the idea. That's their heretical teaching. But the simple debunking to that is this, is that, look, when we're thinking that Christ died for the church, we're obviously not thinking that when Christ died for the church, he meant only the church. No, that's not the idea. Let me give you an easy example, okay? Uh, and you're going to get that example today, all right? So then uh, Sister Sheila, she gave me uh, groceries. So when I say that, am I simply thinking she only gave me groceries? No, because actually she gave it to everybody in the church. So then everyone can get groceries. But why do I say that? I'm saying that because it's precious to me. And I'm thinking about what she gave personally to me. But that doesn't mean that she gave it only strictly to me. She gave it the groceries to everybody else in the church as well. That's just common sense. That's the same thing right here. When Christ died for the church, the church is thinking something very personal to us. See, Christ died, gave himself to the church. But that doesn't mean that he didn't die for everybody. He died for everybody too. All right? Hey, when I say Christ died for me, Jesus loves me, this I know, am I a stupid Calvinist to think Jesus only loves Gene Kim? He's that special. He doesn't love you, 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 or any of you. And he only died for me. He didn't die for any of you. Come on, use your head. We know what that means. It just means something that's personal to yes. you. Yes. That's it. It doesn't mean it's some kind of universal truth that doesn't apply to everybody. Come on, man. Calvinists were for such brilliant scholars. They're the dumbest people in the entire world. Come on, not even common sense people who, who don't graduate from high school even think that level. Not even children are stupid like Calvinists. Children think, children sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. You think they're stupid like Calvinists to think, oh, Jesus only loves me, not you. <laughs> Children are smarter than Calvinists, and can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Amen. You wicked, evil Calvinists. Some of you act. So, uh, some of you. So look, I know that uh, there are some Calvinists that are good people, but the reason why I'm kicking them so hard is that you'd be surprised that some big shots that you know about today, big names, so scholastically, intellectually minded, and then they put this pompous level above the people with fake humility and fake love. And that's the reason why I kick these guys. I mean, this pompous level, I'm special, elect, and uh, you don't know much about soteriology, and you don't know much about theology, and which seminary did you graduate from, and oh my, oh man, it just makes me barf. I kick people really hard when they use that kind of intellectual, educational pride level on them. So I'm going to use my credentials to rub dirt on them too. Why not? Amen. All right, let's look at uh, verse 28, and we'll wrap it up. So let me move toward this side. That way people can read the words here. The Bible says, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. So notice that the man should love the wife. So the wife here, you men are supposed to love her. Uh, yeah, I do love her. Uh, how much do you love her, right? Right. Apparently, to 
Uh, wives, not enough. <laughs> Probably all wives are saying that. But anyways, uh, let, going back over here, the idea is how much you should love your wife, husband, is you love them as much as you would do your own body. How much do you love yourself? Come on. You men love so much about yourself, that's why you want to use and abuse your power, right? Mistreat the woman. If, how much do you love yourself? If you love yourself that much, that's how much you should love the wife. Then you, know, real, then you realize, wow, that means then there's no way I can abuse my authority in one little slip. Yeah, you can't. Keep reading. He that loveth his wife, what does it say? Loveth himself. When you love your wife, you're loving yourself. All right, how much do you love yourself? Apparently all the time. Otherwise, you wouldn't be uh, arguing with her quite often. Why do you argue with her? Because you're thinking about what you want, not what she wants. That's why arguments quite often happen. Is because you're mostly thinking about yourself rather than the wife. Yes. But if you put the wife together with you in that same aspect... Love becomes even more powerful and stronger. Didn't you know that? You know what makes love even stronger? When a wife's desire is the exact same as the husband's desire. If you both love a basketball game, for example, that's why the love becomes even stronger and you enjoy the time together. Because the opinions, both different, two opinions truly become one and the same. What you both love becomes one and the same. And it's not just you alone. Loving that thing, it's always good to have another person who loves the same thing with you. And it feels such a great thing. So that's the beauty. See, that's God's ordination of a Christian home. And if you follow along, you ladies got to realize this. Genesis 3, I quoted to you that your desire shall be to your husband. So it's not just the husband. You women have to do the same thing too. Is that as much as you desire and love yourself, it has to be to the husbands at Genesis 3. So it's so important that if everyone does their role in the home, then it will be truly a loving family, a loving marriage that divorce is practically impossible and that other people will envy and that they would wonder, why does your marriage last 50 years? I wish mine can last like yours. Well, then maybe you should uh, quit those liberal, independent, rebellious beliefs that you studied and were brainwashed at high school and college. Maybe you should quit your feminist studies. Yeah, some of them major on that. See how many of them went through a divorce. See how many of them are truly happy. All right, let's uh, close with a word of prayer, all right? I hope that this yeah. teaching has been very helpful and that um, it will make you live a happy life. The point of God is not to oppress people and make them miserable. The whole idea is love and unity and pure happiness. And there is, here's one thing. This is common sense, okay? Common sense is this. Even the most wicked person will admit this. If there is somebody they're not willing to follow the instructions under, there's got to be a limitation somewhere. Otherwise, it's what? Anarchy. Yep. There has to be order somewhere. There has to be someone following the orders of someone somewhere. If you don't put that anywhere, society cannot even live or function well. Make sense? Okay, let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers and that we will obey what you wrote. I'm not saying about wives obeying the husband or even members obeying the pastor. I'm saying we obey you, Father. We obey you on what you instructed because it's all about you. The sin that we've committed is like what David said when he committed the sin of adultery and murder. It's to thee I have sinned against thee only have I sinned. And it's not to the, those in authority, even though we do, but the real person that we're committing sin against is you. Help us to keep that in mind so that we can live happy lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.